I was not always someone who loved art. In fact, I'm still on that journey. I used to go to music when my mom would take me to museums, God bless her. She growing up, she'd always take me to museums. I would sit there in the center, like with those couches or those things you can sit on in the middle of museums. And I would kick my legs and I would look up and be like, when are we going? Can we go to the gift shop? So those of you who are watching who think, oh, you know, Julie's super interested in art or as people email me, they go, I envy your interest in art. I didn't always have it. So if you don't have it, I promise you, you can get it. It's just, you have to be open to it and you don't need to be an expert. But anyway, I, I've really fallen in love with Giotto and this arena chapel. And this chapel is outside of Venice in Italy. And it was commissioned by this banker uh, named Enrico Scrovegni. And he was the son of a banker. He was a banker himself. And he essentially commissioned Giotto to do this chapel for him as a good work, because obviously back in those days, you could kind of, it, it was sort of common that people believed that they could buy their way into heaven if they did a good work like that. Also in Catholicism, there used to be, and perhaps still is, this idea of the sin of usury. And so this... Uh, banker Scrovegni commissioned this chapel to atone for uh, usury, even though he's using his money from usury to pay for the chapel. But we're not going to get too detailed into it. I just want to show you some of my favorite parts. And yes, this is a beautiful religious chapel. And as you know, I'm sort of on a religious journey, so I, I enjoy seeing things like this. But just putting the religious element aside, this is just fantastic artwork. And what I love about Giotto, among other things, is that he's actually hilarious, as you are about to see. We think of people in the 14th century as, you know, very austere and serious, especially when they're painting the passions of Christ and the crucifixion. Giotto's got a sense of humor. On one of the walls, Giotto has 14 paintings of the seven virtues and the seven vices. We're just gonna look at three. The first one we're gonna look at is the virtue of fortitude. This is the only virtue that, that I'll be showing. You can look up the others. But what's cool about this one is, it's just funny, this woman in this fortitude painting is depicted a lot more, shall we say, portly and also manly compared to the other virtues. And that's where Giotto just has a sense of humor because yeah, when you're displaying fortitude, you, you kind of, you don't think of like a dainty little woman, you think of a more masculine looking woman. And so Giotto is spot on depicting that. Yes, Shanzi. I, I think another word would be Rubenesque. Rubenesque. <laughs> times were different back then. And, and to be portly or Rubenesque was a sign of wealth. Unlike my display of Rubenesque, <laughs> which is just a sign of gluttony. But uh, yeah, back in the day, that you know, it was to to be large then was a sign of wealth and status. I had a friend once who said to her mom, "Am I fat?" And her mom said to her, "You're Rubenesque." <laughs> <laughs> Rubenesque. And my friend was like, "Oh, that sounds like a great compliment." And then she Googled it and went, "Oh God." <laughs> guess my mom's trying to communicate something. But no, I, I take your point, but take my word for it that the other uh, virtues, the, the women are just depicted a lot more kind of daintily. So I thought that was funny. But here's the vice, one of the seven vices of envy. And this one is so cool because we have this guy, you know, in flames at the bottom and envy any of us and all of us have experienced envy. It's a sort of rage. It's a sort of like fiery thing that you feel. The person too has this serpent coming out of his tongue. And looking back, the serpent comes up and crawls around and looks at the person. And it shows when, when you're envious, you, you speak poorly of people, you say things that you shouldn't, you kind of transform into this diminished figure of yourself. And I think one of the, the other really interesting parts of this painting is the ear. That person's ear is enormous. It looks almost like one of those elf ears. And 
it's showing that when you're envious, you're very attuned to the li lives of other people in this perverse way. Oh, that's very interesting. You said his. Is that? I, it's hard for me to see. Is that? Did you misgender? Oh God! It, oh, God. it looks like that could be a, a female. Forgive me. I atone if I misgendered. Uh, <laughs> no, the point on the ear is fascinating, though. Oh, my gosh. You know what we should do? Write this down, Sean. Or somebody in the chat write this down so I don't forget it. We should do the seven virtues and seven vices, but of the modern day. Like, if Giotto were a woke, blue-haired lib, what would be the seven virtues and seven vices that he would identify? And when you just said misgendering, he would totally make that one of them. And I'd be so curious how Giotto would depict the misgendering. But we see here, like, this is thoroughly, in my view, different from any other paintings that predated it. Because when you used to see the paintings of the seven virtues and vices, it was very serious and austere and proper and... This is, to me, it's funny. It's apt, but it's also, that ear especially, it, it gives you a kind of chuckle because that's totally what's going on when you're envious. Let's look at another one that I think is absolutely hilarious is the vice of infidelity. Here we have this man who's kind of off his rocker. He looks dazed and confused. And he has a rope tied around him and he's holding up an idol of a woman. And that is so true. He's, he's chained to this, to this woman. What this brings to me is it, how fascinating it is that the, no matter what changes in humanity, no matter how many years pass, the vices don't change. Totally. Their application and their manifestations may change, but the vices are the same. The truth of the Bible has lasted 5,000 years for a reason. And the way people manifest the seven deadly sins, it, it, it may change in its application, but the, it's still the same. That blows my mind. Yes, it that, that there's absolutely. Just this eternal truth that runs through the core of humanity, no matter how much time passes, no matter how much we invent. I always, I always say that it's, it's, it's so true. I always say that whether or not you believe in God, God and religion is so necessary because God is like a kind of divine life coach and the Bible is a kind of like divine life guide and manifesto on human nature. And so absolutely, Sean, you look at that and you're like, oh my gosh, we see this all the time. I do this. I, you know. I'm foolish sometimes, or I envy sometimes, or I'm unfaithful sometimes, etc. And it's weirdly comforting to, to know that all of this has existed for so many thousands and thousands of years. And it harkens back to something I said on a recent Timeless episode, that right now in, in America, in the 21st century, we are on this research kick. And in some areas of life that is totally apt in science and math and technology, there's so much more that we can learn. There are so many diseases we have to cure. There are always more efficient ways of going about life in that realm. But unfortunately, we've channeled a lot of that research mentality into the realm of human nature. And I think that's where we're getting all of these crazy social ideas about gender, for instance. Oh, there are 38 genders. Your gender is actually not your genitalia. It's whatever you feel. We've channeled that research mindset into the realm of human nature. And what we fundamentally don't understand is that unlike science, math, and technology, which is always changing, human nature does not change. Human nature is eternal and constant. And we just need to come back to it and better understand it instead of trying to change it into something that it isn't. We have to control it. And so finally, perhaps the funniest one of Giotto's vices is <laughs> foolishness. I look at this guy, I'm like, yeah, that is so me sometimes. <laughs> he looks like a clown. Also, it is worth noting, this is just Giotto's sense of humor. He is a little bit more portly. He's wearing a bit of an absurd outfit. His face makes him look like a doofus. He's wearing some kind of crown, which I think is also great because sometimes foolish people think that they're better than they are. They, they think that they're more powerful, they're wiser, and they don't realize that they're foolish. So this weird crown on that guy uh, amazingly encaptures that. And he's holding up some kind of stick and just doing something foolish. 
I think it's a rain stick. Have you ever seen a rain stick? No. Oh, they make, I don't know where they originate from, but it's just a stick with little beads in it, and you turn it upside down, and it sounds like rain, and you turn it upside down, and it sounds like rain, and you turn it upside down. Oh, yeah. And it sounds like rain, and it it's probably not a rain stick. I just think of somebody just turning a rain stick up and down mm-hmm. incessantly as foolish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 719 years ago today, this chapel was consecrated, and I know I've said it, but I'll say it again go down the rabbit hole with this. You know, I'm not a Giotto expert. I don't know everything about him. I don't know everything about the chapel, but there are cool and hilarious details like that, which I promise will just capture your imagination.